Welcome back to the Home Studio Simplified channel. Today we'll be continuing and ending the Creating a Song step-by-step -step video series. This will be video six of the series, the last video where we are going to cover mastering. If you have not watched videos one through five, I would definitely recommend that you do that so that you can be brought up to speed as to how we got to this point. There will be a ticker in the upper right hand corner of the screen even now that will lead you to a playlist where you can watch all of those videos in succession and see how we got to this point. Now, when speaking of this point, we're talking about a completely mixed song that's been mixed down into a stereo format to a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, which is the industry standard for CDs. And the bit rate is 24 bit, which is the industry standard for uh, most online streaming services. So what we have is a stereo track, a completed mix that we've mixed down and now we've flown into a separate session that we're gonna be using for mastering. Now, when it gets to this particular subject, up until this point, everything that I've spoke of, I've usually had a lot of agreement with, and I have to preface this video by saying that I am not against mastering engineers. In fact, I find their job very helpful, and I'm not telling you to bypass a mastering engineer. If you have the money, please, I would definitely recommend that you actually use a mastering engineer if you can. Um, there's several reasons for that. For one, when you're married to a mix and you've mixed it all of this time, you're kind of, um, you're very partial to that mix. And so you're not going to pick up on things that maybe some new fresh set of ears is going to hear. Likewise, a mix, or rather a mastering engineer is going to have a lot more years of experience doing exactly just that, mastering things and getting them to an industry standard loudness. They're going to be more up to pace as far as what those standards are in the industry during that time that you're submitting your song to them. And if you're uh, sending it off to a mastering engineer, you're also going to get probably a more uh, finely detailed set of ears that's going to listen to this thing as a whole, and they're going to be able to put their creative touch on it as well. So with all that being said, it is, however, possible to master your own work. And this is where I'm probably going to come into, uh, there's going to be a little bit of division as of, like I said, as of up until this point, a lot of people have agreed with the points that I've made. They've agreed with a lot of the things that I've shared and a lot of great feedback has been flooding in. Appreciate all of your guys' feedback, the comments and the attaboys, the pats on the back. I appreciate all of it. And uh, my greatest desire is for this series to help you. And this, I think, is going to help you as far as uh, getting your mind wrapped around what mastering is. So uh, there's been different ways that people have described mastering over the years. Uh, probably one of the best analogies that I've ever heard is that uh, a mix is sort of like the present and you've got it all wrapped and it's all, you know, hidden away and tucked in there and it's beautiful and it's waiting to be revealed for the world to go in and to open up and to see. However, mastering is like putting the bow on the present. It's like that finishing touch, that final thing that presents it in such a way to where it's more appealing. Now, in a technical aspect, mastering is more than just making a song loud. It's actually balancing out the tonality and it's helping it to translate well across a lot of different sources. So mastering in and of itself is more than just making things loud, but it's also balanced just as much as mixing is. But this is a balance of the whole mix. And so a mastering engineer's job, or if you're gonna be mastering your own work, you have to take into account that whenever you make an EQ move, you're not just EQing one guitar or one set of guitars, you're actually EQing everything in the mix when you make a small adjustment. So with all of that being said, let's dive right into what we're doing with this particular song, and I'll show you exactly how I've got it to a point where I feel like it translates best to a wide variety of sources. So first and foremost, we just talked about balance, and balance is the hugest thing that you can do for a mix, and it's also the best thing that you can do for a master. And the only way that that master is going to translate well across a wide variety of sources is to get it to be well balanced EQ-wise. So one of the first things that I've got on this um, mix bus, if you want to call it that, this, this track here, um, is an EQ. And I'm using a specific EQ, which we're gonna go into here in just a minute. And if you've watched any of my previous videos, you know that I don't give specific numbers, but I just give a general representation of that because every song is different. But at least I give you the, uh, the concept of why I'm doing or the precept of why I'm doing a thing rather than just trying to show you definite numbers so that you don't get 
sort of led astray on I always have to do this on every mix. And then secondarily, I have another instance of an EQ, which we'll talk more about that one. And it's doing something totally different than this first one. And then thirdly, I have my mastering plugin on here, and that is just simply uh, T-Rex, uh, the one plugin. And we'll cover that, maybe not so much in depth, which there are videos on my channel that cover all of the T-Rex plugins. If you want to go and check that out, I actually do a little bit more in depth on this. And then on the pro channel, just real simple. I've got some uh, console emulation going on, got the drive all the way up. That's just to add a little bit of harmonic excitement and to get that analog sound back into the signal. And then on the EQ that's on the pro channel, simply rolling off with a high pass filter, everything below 30 hertz and everything above 12,000 kilohertz. And there's very, very minimal amount of compression that's going on. And I'm talking like it's just barely touching the needle. And that's just to add a little bit of glue and it's to add just a little bit of uh, leveling out of certain transients and things of that nature. Okay, so let's talk more about this tonality and I wish that I could show you um, these reference tracks, um, but unfortunately I can't. I will be flagged and then they will remove monetization from this video and I kind of need that, not to mention I don't want any uh, copyright infringement flags on my channel. So, But I can give you the artist name as well as the songs that I'm using and then I will explain why I'm using these reference tracks. But first let's talk about the balance and it's actually kind of tied in and dovetailed with these reference tracks. So the balance of the song is sort of determined by the production of the song. Does it have lots of highs, lots of lows? Is it just four on the floor all the way through, just both barrels? Or is it a soft song that's more melodic and it, it's up close and personal? You have to think about all of these things when you're trying to get the mastering balance underway. Now this song has ebbs and flows. It's like most of my music, it has a, a point where it kind of comes in small and then it builds up and then it drops back out again and then it crashes in again and then it drops out completely and then there's this huge crescendo at the end. So taking all that into account, I have to think, okay, what would be the best reference track to pull in to achieve that sound of that balance that I'm wanting? Now, the reference tracks that I've chosen are all from the same band, uh, simply because this album in general was just mixed very well, mastered very well, and so whenever I heard it, I was like, I really like what they've done. I want to use these songs. This bottom one here, The Struggle, is the name of the song from the band 10th Avenue North. I specifically picked this one due to its bass rich content. I love the way the bass guitar sounds in this and I wanted to kind of use that as a reference so that I could get my bass to sort of sound a little bit like that. Now obviously it's not going to be perfect but and then this one here you'll notice that it's very like loud and, and just up in your face all the way through the song. However the drums in this particular song as well as some of the uh, stereo width is amazing and this is the song Don't Stop the Madness by the same 10th Avenue North. Now this one on the top is the one that I probably referenced from the most. It's a song called Worn by the same band 10th Avenue North and this song you'll notice I picked because it almost has the exact same production elements that mine does. You see there's an ebb and a flow in this song. It starts out sort of a, in a lull, it builds up, it drops out, it builds up, it drops out, and then there's this huge crescendo at the end, and I was able to take this last portion, this last section, and just loop it on that huge build where both of the songs are, kind of A, B them, and say, okay, mine's a little bit louder, I need to bring it back, I need to tone it back a little. Um, but by and large, you need to choose your references, not based off of so much just does it sound exactly like the song that I'm using, or are the production elements the same, but there needs to be a specific reason as to why you're choosing your, those reference tracks. And it needs to sound almost the same as, as far as, uh, well, for instance, you're not going to pick a death metal song for a ballad, and you're not going to pick, you know, um, an EDM song for a country song. You're just you got to use obviously some wisdom here um, but basically pick songs that you like that you've heard before that you especially like the mix or the master and certain elements of that accentuate in your master and try to get it to that to that point now there's a free plugin that's used in this uh, mastering process at least in my mastering process that, that's called span you can get this for free from the Vox Injo website 
Um, it's an awesome, awesome plugin. If you don't own it, you need to. There's so many uses for this thing. Uh, eventually, I plan on trying to do, which I'm sure there's probably a million out there, but I'm going to try to do like a more in-depth review on this. Because especially for mastering, what you can do with this thing is you see here, um, this uh, green collar here is your main track. And then you have an underlay track. And you can set up to like three different underlays here. You can actually route your underlays as to being these reference tracks. And what you can do is, because this is a spectrum analyzer, you can set it to an average. And basically what that will do is just smooth out everything. And I even have a, a 1 sixth octave smoothing on to just kind of show like a broad spectrum of exactly where the song is at um, on, the, on the EQ spectrum side of things. So just to kind of uh, show you what I'm talking about, I'm going to turn this song down dramatically and then play this so that I can talk over top of it. But just to kind of show you what this plugin is doing. So you'll see that right now I'm seeing a visual representation of the EQ of this song. Now if I was to move it towards the end here, you're going to see all of that begin to rise up now. Okay, and then I can actually hold that by pushing this hold button here, and I, I can actually see that visual representation of this spectrum um, after it's played the entire song. And I like to use average for that particular reason. And when I have reached the end of the song, I have a good representation, once again, of where it sets sonically. So because of I've played it at the point that I've played it at, you'll notice that there's a kind of a, a dip missing out of the 1K and there's a boost in the 700 uh, hertz region. And so what I would do if I was looking at that without knowing that actually the whole song after it plays out, e this all evens out over time. Um, but what I would do if, like let's say this was played the whole way through, I would say, okay, I'm obviously, um, I need to boost a little in this area and cut a little in this area so that I can try to kind of smooth this entire region out. And um, it doesn't have to be this way all the time, but your first master that you bounce out of your DAW, I would try to go by that rule to try to get everything as smooth as possible uh, across the EQ spectrum here. And that's just going to give you a good starting point to know, okay, where's the song setting sonically on other sources? So t take and, and level all of those, those um, EQ spectrums out and then take that and listen to it on several different sources. Listen to it on earbuds, listen to it through a mono speaker, on desktop speakers. Take it to your church and listen to it through the system. Um, just anywhere and everywhere that you can. And then whenever you're doing that, make notes on each place that, you've wrote, that you're, you're listening to it and write down what you're noticing from each place. And this will give you sort of a rough average of what you need to do when you come back to the studio to bounce out version 2. So just a real quick tip, and this is how you can actually use visual aspects to help your mastering. Um, I know, especially in the audio world, we don't want to go off of our eyes all of the time, but there are times when it's definitely useful, and this is one of them. So yet again, this is a free plugin. Now, the master that I'm working on is being routed into this master bus here, and the reference tracks are being, re are being routed into bus B so that they don't hit my master and then I can see separately what the metering is versus the metering on my mastered track. I hope that made sense. So T-Rex 5 also has a great, um, I would use it for mastering, but it's a, a great metering plug and this has got so much information on it all at once. Um, it's just, it's unheard of. So if I was to play this now, and it shouldn't be too loud, so I'll go ahead and hit play. You'll notice that I have a lot of information on the screen right now. Let me turn this down a little bit more. So you'll notice that I have a lot of information on the screen right now. I have an RMS, which is my average loudness of the entire song. I have my true peak, which is where it's actually peaking out. And then I have this goinometer, which is going to tell me the stereo width. And if I was to fold this down into mono, you would see that would go all the way up the middle. So this is what it would look like. Uh, on the goinometer if it was in mono. When I bring it back out to stereo, however, we see exactly where it's going in the stereo field. The wider that is, the more stereo width that you have in your mix. 
And then we also have this uh, the spectrum analyzer here. And there's just these meters here. I mean, there's so much. And what you can do within Cakewalk by BandLab is actually um, take this section right here and pin it. Then play your other reference tracks, bring it up, and now you can watch them side by side and say, okay, I noticed that the RMS on this song is around negative uh, 10, and mine's at negative 12. I need to bring it up a couple of dBs, or down a couple of dBs, whichever direction you need to go. And makes it really quick and easy to, to kind of dial it in as far as loudness, so that you're not getting to that point where you're bypassing industry standards and you're crushing everything. Um, but you're also not making it so quiet that whenever it plays next to a already mastered track, a professionally mastered track, if someone had it on their iPod or something like that, or their their phone, they're not going to be going like, whoa, what just happened? I have to turn everything up all of a sudden. So that's all about uh, the, the metering plugins there that you would need to use. Now let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper to the actual EQ moves that I've made. Now when I get to this point, I'm probably going to be laughed to scorn because I've done a dirty little trick and I've cheated just a little bit. And I'm going to show you what I've done. So with this plugin here, this is called the Newfangled Equivocate. I got this for free from the Plugin Collective. This is a free plugin where they give away either one free plugin a month or a huge drastic discount once a month from Focusrite. And it's called the Plugin Collective. You can go and check it out. Um, if you own a Focusrite preamp or anything made by Focusrite, all you simply have to do is register that product and you can get these for free all the time. This was one of the plugins that they gave away for free way back in the day and I grabbed it up and never really thought I would use it that much. I just thought it looks cool and I don't know, I might. Then I dove deep into it um, some months back and I realized why have I not been using this all along. The reason why this plugin is so cool is because, simply said, I can take and play my um, references through this plugin. Okay, uh, you, got, you got to hear this out. I can take and play my references through this plugin, and then I can select this button here that says Match EQ. And what that does is it literally moves the EQ to the same place um, where it would set sonically if there was a graphic equalizer on that track. And then I can just simply marry that to the master that I'm trying to get to sound like that reference. Now, is it perfect? Absolutely not. I still have to make adjustments, but I get it really close to home. And this is the EQ plot that it gave me after listening to the song, the main song that I wanted to reference off of, this Warren song. And so my mix was basically uh, lacking in these areas and it was way too heavy in these areas. And so what it did is it basically just brought it to a point where it's very, very close to my reference. And then I just simply make adjustments by ear af after that point. So very, very cool. Um, there's a lot of other plugins out there that do that. So if you don't have this particular plugin, I'm not saying you have to rush out and buy it. By all means, you could do this by ear. It would just take longer. And I'm all about doing things quick. So then on the next level down here, this next EQ that we're using, um, which obviously everything is going through the Pro Channel EQ first, then on this next one, I'm using the LP EQ. This is a stock plugin that comes with Cakewalk by BandLab. It's a linear phase equalizer, and it also has this really cool expert mode. When you click it into expert mode, you can set it to mid-side. Now by using mid-side, this is mainly used in mastering anyway, what I can do is I can select a uh, portion of the EQ spectrum here and I can either set it to the sides, to the stereo, or to the mids. And I've selected the sides and I'm basically I'm dipping everything from 100 hertz below out of the sides so that it, there's no hardly any bass information whatsoever in the sides, which is where I've got my guitars panned, my strings panned areas where there doesn't need to be any bass information. The bass information, generally speaking, is always going to be up the middle. So then, um, with this particular 600 hertz is where I was lacking whenever I had done my EQ spectrums, my visually looked at it, I was lacking in that area, so I just simply did a, a very small 1 dB boost here uh, with a Q of 1, so it's a really broad boost. And then likewise, I turned up everything above 8,400 uh, kilohertz 
and this was just on the sides as well and that's just to give the sides an extra little boost only a 2 dB boost but it was enough to help uh, open up the stereo width and make it just sound a little more um, honestly just a little more shimmery I guess if that's a word and then the very last thing in the chain and this is where the mastering the whole mastering process is tied into this is the crescendo the icing on the cake and how I got it to my loudness is I just simply used the T-Rex one plug-in now there's a million different plugins you could use I simply choose to use this one because it's got everything right there where I need it and it just does a really really good job so um, just real quickly like I said I'm not going to go into an in-depth description of what this plugin does or how to use it but basically the air just does exactly what it says it adds a little bit of air so anything above a certain well basically the high end is affected and it does it in such a way to where it doesn't just boost things it actually adds harmonic excitement as well the focus is your low mids and your mids and then your body is your low end and your low mids and so by adjusting these uh, the focus you turn it up and it kind of just brings the mud out of a, a mix and just kind of obviously you can overdo anything so you you can see I've used these really sparingly but um, it just works it's just an amazing mastering processor then the punch button anything that I've done with these here when I turn the punch up it accentuates those and adds harmonic excitement the width I to be honest I never use on this um, I've used it a couple of times and I thought it sounded really great until I listened to it on a mono source and I'm really big about mixing in mono and I want it to sound good in mono and in just like most width adding plugins it just doesn't it adds some kind of like ninja trickery on the back end that doesn't sound good in mono so I just to be honest I don't use it unless it's on a single track or something like that but the volume does exactly what it says it simply just boosts the volume and it limits it at the same time it will not let it go above the negative uh, one uh, zero point or yeah negative zero point one threshold so it just limits it but it lets you crank it up if you want without squashing everything either I don't know how it does it but it does it it's amazing now this transient section if you dial it back if there's like really harsh transients if you've got really harsh snare hits or guitar picks are just like crazy you can dial that back and it'll actually kind of take care of them a little bit and um, if you put it forward your snare hits your bass hits your uh, kick drum and stuff like that it's just gonna be a little bit more uh, punchy and then analog does exactly what it says it does it adds a little bit of like an analog flair to it basically it's like a harmonic exciter as well but mainly for the the warmness of the mix and bass punch yet again it's kind of self-explanatory but it adds a an element of punch to the bass without causing muddiness so and basically guys really that is that is it and then after doing all of this um, I will spend you know an hour or two just pouring back and forth between my references and getting my actual master up to the loudness that it needs to be and really I mean I hate to oversimplify this because it's it's really not this simple um, and I've taken it's taken me years to develop an ear to get it to this point and even at that I don't have the kind of studio that I really need or the ears I believe that I need to get this done as quickly as I could have in fact I think um, you'll notice this says 13 fall time pre and that stands for it's a pre master so this is my 13th attempt at trying to get it balanced out and I'm talking like when you get past attempt number three or four we're talking like really like 0.5 DB boost here and cuts there just to get that to where when you listen to it in the car when you listen to it on the PA system at church when you listen to it on a mono speaker it starts to just be like okay I'm, it's leveled out it sounds really good on all of these sources I'm just gonna have to go with it now I'm, I'm 13 tries into it um, if you watch my video how to know when your mix is finished that's exactly the same principle that I apply to the master I simply listen to it on all these sources and when I have nothing left to write down I realize okay it's done I need to go ahead and press it so to speak uh, export that thing out and get it done and and released so just real quickly I'm gonna go ahead and turn this back up to uh, full full steam ahead here and um, hopefully this will not blast your ears out but I want you to hear 
uh, the before and after of each one of these plugins. So this would be the mix just as it stands coming in, you know, straight out of the gate. So loud sound in three, two, and one. So hopefully you were able to hear exactly what those EQ moves were doing, and obviously the mastering was making it incredibly loud. I apologize if I blew your eardrums on that. Um, but basically I wanted you to hear uh, that this mastering was taking what I felt like was already a really good mix and just adding a little bit of sparkle, adding a little bit of touch and pizzazz to it. And definitely I feel like made it sound a lot better and it translated well on a large uh, variety of sources. So, yet again, I don't want to oversimplify this, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be as hard as what some make it. And you can do it yourself. It just takes a lot of practice. Um, if this is something that you found helpful, please take the time to subscribe and go ahead and click the bell icon. And that way you'll be the first to be notified about when I upload a new video. I do videos like this all of the time, and I also love to do gear reviews, which I have uploaded quite frequently as well. If you have any questions about anything that we've covered on this series, feel free to drop that in the comment section down below, and I would be more than happy to help in any way that I possibly can. So now let's take this mastered song, and let's go ahead and upload it to our digital distributor, and let's get it ready to uh, send out to the world for everyone to hear. Okay, now on to the second portion of this last video in creating a song step by step. This is, we've already got our mastered song, and now we're just ready to get the song out to the world for them to hear. And um, there are many different streaming and distribution services for online stores and things of this nature, but I have just went with DistroKid ever since I can remember. And uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They just do a phenomenal job, and for 20 bucks a year, they get your song into nearly every online store that you can think of. And there's other upgrades that you can pay for as well. Um, I've always opted out of even paying for those just simply because they, I mean, it gets it out there anyway. So as you can see, this is my DistroKid, um, sort of the back end of it, um, what you would see if you were logged in for the first time. So I'm just going to go through here and we're just going to, like I would normally would, we're going to go ahead and just upload the song and, and get it ready to go off for uh, the whole world to hear. Okay, so you have many different options here. Spotify, Apple, iTunes. I just go ahead and select them all. I mean, I'm really going to want to get my tunes out to everybody anyway. So then you have this option here. Is it one song? Is it a single? Or is it a collection of songs? And you can uh, go all the way up to 35 songs, it looks like. Now, obviously, I'm just releasing a single here. So I'm going to leave it right there. Is this something that's been previously re released? I'm going to select no. This is brand new. The artist slash band name, I'm going to leave that as mine. The release date, let's go ahead and set that as today. 
There is no iTunes pre-order, although you can upgrade later to do that. And then the record label will be distrokid.com unless you upgrade and uh, you want to make your own record label or run it off of another. And then we also have to have some artwork for our single that we're going to be releasing or our album. I've already went ahead and made mine. Nothing too fancy, but I'm going to go ahead and drop that in here. Alright, so there's my artwork that I've created for my album cover. This is what will show up in iTunes and all the other places whenever they go to play this song. And then it asks for what language is it in. Obviously it's in English. What's the primary genre? Um, I'm going to go ahead and put Christian Gospel because they don't have just like alternative Christian. And then for a secondary genre, I'm going to go with uh, Singer-Songwriter. All right, song title is Fall Time. Okay, that's good. And now the audio file, we have to select the audio file to upload, and it prefers it to be in WAV, WMA, M4A, MP3, or yada, yada, yada. I would go with a WAV file as it's gonna be the best representation of the song. It's gonna be the, the highest fidelity. So I always use a WAV file and I will Whenever I'm mastering that song, I master it. So up until this point, I've always used 24-bit. I will try to master it at 24-bit as well. Um, however, for CDs and things like that, you have to downgrade it to 16-bit. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it at 24-bit. We're just going to upload it from there. So I'm going to go ahead and select Browse, Fall Time Master. And there's that. Now it's going to ask... Is this another artist's song? In other, in other words, it's a cover song or if it's the song that you wrote. So I'm going to select, I wrote this song or manage the songwriter. It's an original tune. Then the songwriter's real name uh, for music and lyrics and all of this. I'm going to go ahead and select myself. Now you all know my middle name. So I'm going to select the option here that says it does not have explicit lyrics. It's going to ask if this is a radio edit. In other words, this song is clean and always has been. So you can select no or yes, there is an explicit version of this song, but this is the clean or censored version of it. So I'm going to select no, this song is clean and always has been. If it's instrumental, I'm going to say no because this song contains lyrics. And then preview clip start time let the streaming services decide that sounds good to me iTunes price I usually just leave that alone 99 cents is fine now here's all the extra optional things that you can you can do and it's up to you all right and then lastly you have to do all of these mandatory check boxes I selected YouTube music as a store so I won't email DistroKid later asking why do you upload my music to YouTube? Okay, it literally says that. And then I recorded this music and I'm authorizing it to the stores um, and collect all royalties. I'm not using any other artist's name in my song titles or album title without their approval. I've read and agree to the terms and then select done. So now at this point, it's gonna upload your album artwork and your track and then you're, you're good to go. So once the song is completely uploaded and everything is good to go, your artwork is good to go, then they will email you as that uh, song goes live in different stores and they'll let you know which store it has went live in. So at the time that I've released this video, this song will already have been live. So, all right, that's, it's just that simple. So now it's gonna go to all of those stores everywhere and our song is released.